Where do our ideas of freedom and equality come from? How did we start critiquing private property and gender norms? How did we become anti-imperialist? In short, what are the origins of the left? There are many stories of how the left began. Here is one. Louis Armand Lanton was a French aristocrat who enlisted to become an army officer in the New World because of insurmountable crushing debt of his father. In late August 1683, he mounted a small warship from the seaport of La Rochelle in western France. After a difficult voyage of one month, he reached Quebec. Louis Armand was sent to help wage war against the Native American tribe of the Iroquois. At one point, several Iroquois who had been under Christian missionary tutelage were captured by the French. They were tortured by the Algonquin Indian allies who took pleasure in maltreating exactly those Iroquois whom the missionaries segregated from the general Iroquois population. Louis Armand interceded and hit some of those young tormentors who reached for their weapons to kill him. He was only saved by the Canadians who told the Algonquin that he was drunk. To prevent further trouble, Louis Armand was asked to go on an expedition whose purpose was to destroy villages and crops of the native population. He was then requested by the governor to build a fort on the upper lakes and take possession of this vast region in the name of the king. At this point, Louis Armand left his compatriots and traveled alone among natives for several months. It may be the case that Louis Armand was already critical of Christianity to begin with. Nevertheless, it is also clear that his unbelief as well as his critique of Western civilization deepened, both by the behavior of the colonizers and by experiencing the life of the Native Americans. He starts recounting the lives of the Native Americans thus. The savages are utter strangers to distinctions of property, for what belongs to one is equally in others. Their life, he goes on, is unaffected by money, which they call the French serpent. He then gives us their viewpoint on Western civilization. They tell you that amongst us, the people murder, plunder, defame, and betray one another for money. They think it unaccountable that one man should have more than the other, and that the rich should have more respect than the poor. In short, they say, the name of savages which we bestow upon them would fit our own selves better since there is nothing in our actions that bears an appearance of wisdom. They brand us slaves and call us miserable souls whose life is not worth having, alleging that we degrade ourselves in subjecting ourselves to one man who possesses the whole power and is bound by no law but his own will. Besides, they value themselves above anything that you can imagine, and this is the reason they always give for it, that one is as much master as another. And since all men are made of the same clay, there should be no distinction or superiority among them. Louis Armand devotes many pages to their resistance to Christianity. It is clear that he uses their persona in order to critique Christianity, a critique that he may have had before getting to know them. However, it is also clear that meeting with them has powerfully demonstrated for him a society that lives perfectly well without that religion. The word faith is enough to choke them. They make jest of it and allege that the writings of the ages are false, superstitious. They plead that a man must be a fool who believes that an omnipotent being, continuing from all eternity in a state of inactivity, did not think of giving being to creatures till within these five or six thousand years or that at the time God created Adam on purpose to have him tempted by an evil spirit to eat of the apple, and that he occasioned all the misery of his posterity by pretended transmission of his sin. They ridicule the dialogue between Eve and the serpent, alleging that we affront God in supposing that he wrought the miracle of giving this animal the use of speech with the intent to destroy all of the human race. After supplying many powerful arguments against Christianity, Louis Armand writes, Such, sir, is the obstinacy and preposition of these people. I flatter myself that this short view of their notions may divert you without offense. 
I know that you are too well confirmed and riveted in our most holy faith to receive any dangerous impression from impious advances. I assume myself that you will join me in bemoaning the deplorable state of these ignorant wrenches. This is one possible way in which religious and political authority was challenged at the end of the 17th century. Encounter with the natives has intensified criticism of every authority, both religious and political. Of course, such critique could not be articulated directly on pain of death, and yet dozens of writers and intellectuals undertook it. What is no less important for our purposes is the way Louis Armand characterizes the life of the natives. Again and again, while describing different facets of Native American life, Louis Armand stresses their egalitarianism, and I quote, one man among them is as good as another, for all are upon the same level. They have no disorders occasioned by girl or wife. A young woman is allowed to do what she pleases, let her conduct be what it will be. Neither father nor mother, brother nor sister can pretend to control her. A young woman, say they, is master of her own body, and by the natural right of liberty is free to do what she pleases. Louis Armand stresses that true equality allows for sexual relationships that are not distorted by power. A young man, he says, visits a tent of a young woman who uses a simple gesture to let him know whether he is wanted or not. I quote, If she blows out the light, he lies down with her, but if she pulls her covering over her face, he retires, that being a sign that she will not receive him. Native Americans are incredulous that, I quote, Europeans who value themselves upon their sense and knowledge should be so blind and so ignorant as not to know that marriage in their way is a sort of trouble and uneasiness. To be engaged for one's lifetime to them is a matter of wonder and surprise. They look upon it as a monstrous thing to be tied to one another without any hopes of being able to untie or break the knot. It is allowable both for men and women to part when they please. Commonly, they give each other another eight days warning. Sometimes they offer reasons to justify their conduct. But so, for the most part, the usual plea is that they are sick and out of order and that a repose is much more proper for them than the fatigue of a married life. Louis Armand goes on to describe how the savages go by the mother's name, that is, their matrilineal kinship system. He also relates that there are types of women who will not marry at all. These women are called hunting women, as they join the men in the hunt. He claims that they are too independent for marriage, too careless for bringing up children, and too impatient for staying indoors the whole winter. I quote, Their parents and relations dare not censor their vicious conduct. On the contrary, they seem to approve of it, in declaring, as I said before, that their daughters have command of their own bodies and may dispose of their person as they deem fit, they being at liberty to do what they please. Louis Armand describes the way in which the Jesuits try to repress the behavior of these women. And I quote, The Jesuits do the utmost to prevent the lewd practices of these whores, by preaching to their parents that their indulgence is very disagreeable to the Great Spirit and that they must answer before God for not confining their children to a measure of contency and chastity and that a fire is kindled in the other world to torment them forever unless they take care more to correct vice. To such remonstrances, the men reply, that's admirable. And the women usually tell the good fathers in a deriding way, that if their threats be well grounded, the mountains of the other world must consist of the ashes of souls. Louis Armand goes on to depict the health of the savages. He relates that they are well built, with robust and vigorous body, of sanguine temperament and admirable complexion. It is surprising to him that they are so healthy, as they, and I quote, weaken themselves by violent exercise of dancing, hunting, and warlike expeditions in which they have frequent returns of heats and colds in one day, which in Europe would occasion a mortal distemper. 
He even tells that among the Illinois tribe, quote, there are several hermaphrodites who go in the women's habit, but frequent the company of both sexes. These Illinois are strangely given to sodomy, as well as other savages that live near the river Mississippi, end quote. Even the pressure and hierarchy of what we call now as compulsory heterosexuality seems to be missing among the natives. Louis Armand's New Voyages to North America was published in 1703 and became one of the most successful books in the early 18th century, a bestseller. The book has later influenced Jean-Jacques Rousseau and most of the other Enlightenment thinkers, which in turn has made a decisive impact on the French and American revolutions, revolutions that fundamentally changed the world. What can we learn from Louis Armand today? The dynamic of Western civilization and settler societies that Louis Armand critiqued have played themselves out for more than 300 years. Still, just like Louis Armand, we live in a system that is covetous, possessive and violent. A system that both exploits and humiliates most human beings who are made to serve others. There have been certain improvements in longevity and health, but also certainly new lows like the Holocaust and Hiroshima. Regardless, Louis Armand's basic critique still stands. A system that puts money in private possessions at the center has made man slave to man. Thank you.